All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon. Glad you all can make it to this session. So uh, I'm Tim Cortez. I'm the CTO here at Plug, and uh, Dr. Luke Wentland uh, is on our team, and we're going to be talking a little bit about, <clears throat> uh, you know, over the many, many years that uh, we've gotten to this point, um, things have been accelerating very quickly in terms of the hydrogen industry and where things are at. And in the, in the past couple of years, as it's this concept of using hydrogen and how important it could be, um, there's been a lot of questions and concerns and people wondering, you know, uh, let me go to the first slide. So <clears throat> what, does, does hydrogen even make sense? Why are we even thinking about it? And, and then beyond that is, well, is it safe? Is it dangerous? How can we, you know, what are the issues or concerns around it? Um, and I, I don't, I'm going to go in quickly into a little bit of why it makes sense. I know you heard, if you were listening to, to Dr. Brower this morning, he went into a lot of the reasons why it's really important for what we're doing from an ener energy transition perspective and why it's going to be critical. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to touch base a little bit on that, but I want to leave most of the time this afternoon for Luke to talk about some of the misconceptions about hydrogen, some of the myths, um, and some of the uh, information that we have to try and break some of those myths, and we can get into that, a lot of that detail here a little bit later. Um, Andy had a few quotes uh, as well this morning, and particularly um, Secretary Granholm, she talked about Swiss Army knife for zero carbon technologies. If we get it right, it can do just about everything or anything. Um, the president, you know, clean hydrogen is a game changer. Um, it's been recognized by the administration of how important it is. Senator Manchin, uh, we need to invest in the entire hydrogen value chain. And it can tackle a lot of the toughest challenges that we have. Um, so, but but why did why are they saying this? Why is it why is it important? And if we think about part of that discussion that we had this morning with uh, with Jack, <clears throat> and you think about where does our energy come from, and uh, you know I quote him a lot because he, you know when we think about only twenty percent of our energy comes from electrons today, and eighty percent comes from some other form of molecule whether it's coal or natural gas or petroleum. <clears throat> and then you start to think about, is it even possible for that other 80% to electrify um, those applications and, and those? And it's just, it's just not possible. So when you think about, this is where hydrogen as another molecule can really be a solution. Um, and we do want to get as many applications, as many uh, sectors um, uh, electrified but it's just not possible based on <clears throat> some of the applications, what their needs are, um, to be able to do it across the board. So if you think about why is hydrogen important and some of the characteristics, both from a generation perspective, if we do it with renewables and electrolyzers, as well as a fuel cell perspective in terms of generating power from fuel cells, zero emissions, right? And the only output from fuel cell, uh, the only emissions is heat and water. So now you can also think about is there the opportunity if you have an application where you, you're on site generating hydrogen, then you're using that hydrogen to pow provide power with a fuel cell? The byproduct is water, right? So now you can think about recycling some of that water, right? There's going to be losses in the process. But the beauty of, of hydrogen and some of these characteristics is that it's very producible and can be very, done very cleanly. Um, the other thing is flexibility, the ability to move hydrogen, whether it's gaseous or liquid. <clears throat> Provide and store it as well. And, you know, Jack talked about the challenges with batteries, particularly in long duration storage. Um, hydrogen provides that ability to have long duration storage, seasonal storage. If you want to shift from the times of year where we have plentiful wind and solar to times of the year where we don't, hydrogen will be able to do that if we're able to find the right ways to store it. <clears throat> safety, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to touch that because Luke's got several slides on, on uh, hydrogen and safety. Um, but as an industrial feedstock, hydrogen has been used for decades in many, many applications, refinery applications, steel, ammonia. So these industrial applications that are ready and can actually use clean hydrogen today if it's made available. <clears throat> and one of the things that I was on a panel um, here in New York, it was the Independent Power Producers of New York, and I was, uh, there was two gentlemen, one on the left of me, he was from New England, Independent Power Producer, and another gentleman on the right was from National Grid. And the moderator asked the power producer, 
are you interested in using hydrogen to clean up your, your, and he said, his answer was, if this guy to my right, I mean, pointing to me, can generate clean hydrogen, and the gentleman on, his, on the other side of him can move it and get it to my plant, I will absolutely use it. So the ability to use it in these applications is there in many, many. So adoptability, as long as it's at the right price, many of these applications can use it today and are ready to use it. So getting back to splitting up between the two things, as a fuel, using it in applications, whether it's fuel cells, turbines, um, or energy storage, and also in these industrial applications, really make it a, a very, very suitable element to be able to think about how do we decarbonize across all these applications. And it's why we're spending a lot of time looking at where can we go, where does it make sense, where's the customers, what are the sectors, and what are the price points that we need to get to. And I, I don't know if anybody sat in uh, earlier today in this room, we were talking about the, uh, the IRA. And why, why was the IRA put in place? It was in, to ensure we could get the price point of clean hydrogen to be on par with other uh, existing fuels. And the reason for that was to be able to drive, to be able to use them in these applications. Because as Luke and I have been doing some analysis on the IRA, there's willingness to pay, and that price point is different for many different applications. But if you can drive the cost down to the end user, it opens up so many opportunities to use hydrogen in these different applications. And I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Luke. I think he, oh, sorry. Speaking of, I forgot I had a slide here. Um, if you look at the demand that I mentioned in all these different applications, this is a curve with some information for clean hydrogen based on some demand curves that the DOE has put together. And this just shows different sectors, different applications, and what the demand could look like in 2030, 2040, and 2050. And why it's important is because if you then translate that demand in 2040 to the curves on the right, you can actually see that that demand will drive investment. We're talking $18 billion potentially of investment into this sector. <clears throat> And the beauty of that investment and what that really means is jobs, right? So how do we develop and how do we generate jobs? And how do we ensure that that investment continues to happen? And not only that, the abatement. So what's really important is all those sectors that I had on the previous slide, those are all opportunities to decarbonize, right? So if you think about all those sectors that are willing to use it and are going to have a demand for clean hydrogen, you can translate that into greenhouse gas abatement, right? And not only that, we didn't have a chart up here, but Jack talked to also about this morning about um, yeah, the human factors, and we think talk about particulate matter, and that's really impactful to human health. So there's lots of opportunity to abate the particulate matter that's really uh, damaging to health, to the health. So with that, I will turn it over to Luke, and uh, he'll start talking about his actual myths. All right, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> so there's three things that we're going to really go through and talk through today. The first is safety, the second is leakage, and then the third is water, okay, specifically water consumption and kind of a balance, all right? And we're going to walk through kind of where we tend to see a lot of talking points about each of these and then try and lay out where kind of the science and technical position reality is, if you will. All right, so let's talk about safety. I, we've probably all heard this. If you play in the hydrogen space, you hear all kind of different things. Some are kind of true, some are close to being true, and some are wildly un, un, impractical. Um, generally, it all circulates around hydrogen being very unsafe. It's too flammable, it's too explosive, it's too dangerous. I mean, we could sit here and list, list talking points for a while. So let's, let's walk through kind of where the reality of hydrogen as a safe thing is. And I want to differ differentiate first is that there's a difference between being dangerous and being safe. Is hydrogen dangerous? Yes. Is gasoline dangerous? Yes. Is you driving in your car dangerous? Yes. You're driving in a two-ton vehicle at 60 miles an hour down the highway? That's incredibly dangerous, right? Most things are dangerous in this world. Is it safe? Yes. As Tim said, hydrogen is a commodity that's been around for a very long time. This is not new. There are codes, there are standards, there are fire protection standards, there's CGA you know, codes and standards, there's regulations. Hydrogen generally, and we'll talk through this, has a better track record than any other fuel out there, and we'll explain why. But the point again is everyone seems to think this is like very novel, <laughs> and not to you know, beat up on plug a little bit, but it's really not. I mean, it's, it's been around for a long time. Um, anyway, so let's, let's talk through it. We'll first start with toxicity. And this is honestly, I think, a really, really strong benefit is that hydrogen is not toxic and it's not poisonous. 
So in the event that you do have some type of spill, you do have some type of leak, you do have some type of venting to the atmosphere, that's it. You lost product, you lost some money, maybe some, you know, a tank is compromised and you have to get some new hardware, but there's no risk to the environment, the human health, the environmental health, you know, animal, you know, anything like that. Whereas, I mean, I think we're all very familiar in oil spill <laughs> and what that can do. Um, you know, the, the train incident in, was in Indiana a couple months ago. Like, all of these other types of chemicals, not just fuels, but other petrochemicals, obviously a lot of human health and environmental health and toxicity concerns. Um, there's an ammonia tanker, an anhydrous ammonia tanker that had a spill a couple weeks ago, and they had to evacuate everyone in a two-mile radius or something like that for several days. So you don't have that concern here. Next is density and diffusivity, and this plays into how, how easy it is to actually keep hydrogen as something that's safe. Hydrogen is, is, has a very low density, okay? It's about eight times lighter than natural gas. It's 57 times lighter than gasoline vapor. So what does that mean? If I get some gaseous hydrogen out in the world, it's not going to pool and linger and hang out along the ground. Um, whereas that is a critical concern with a passenger vehicle, for example, is if I have my, you know, a leak in my gas tank or you ignite it, those fumes don't go anywhere. They pool, they're, they're denser, they're heavier than air. They're going to sit there and just, you know, continue to ignite and burn your vehicle up. I don't have it in here. There's, if you want the link, there's a very famous video of a study that the DOE did where they intentionally ignited a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. They damaged a PRV so that they had a flare coming out of the tank and then they ignited it intentionally. And they did the same thing with the gasoline vehicle. And that, I mean, the gasoline vehicle just goes up, right? It, the whole vehicle is consumed. It's like what you see on the highway if you go drive by a vehicle fire. Whereas with the fuel cell vehicle, um, they, had a thermal, they had a temperature sensor in the back seat because the tank's kind of in the back of the vehicle, right? And that only went up 13 degrees Fahrenheit. The driver's seat had no change in temperature because it's so directional. It, you have this, you know, this flame, this, this event that occurs, and then it's gone. Right? And it's not radiant. It doesn't spread to the rest of the vehicle in that sense. So because of that low density and that high diffusivity, you know, actually, if you do have an incident like that, it's far safer than any fossil fuel you're using. To that point, diffusivity. It is the most diffusive fuel available. What that means, diffusivity, is how, how easy can the molecules diffuse and move and spread out you know, from where they are, from a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient. right? If I have a leak from a tank, I have a high concentration, it's immediately going to be trying to move and, you know, nature wants to go to steady state. So it's going to move and try and spread away. Because of that high diffusivity, it's very hard to build high concentrations of hydrogen. And it's when you build high concentrations of any fuel is where you start to have safety incidents. If I have 1% of hydrogen in the air, that there, is, there is no real safety risk. You can't ignite that. It's too low. It's only once you build to higher quantities that you start to, you know, where you'd have a concern. Because of that high diffusivity, it's harder to build to those critical points where you have, you know, safety issues that you need to be worried about. To that point, both flammability and ignition energy. Those depend upon that concentration to a degree, right? And so if it's harder to build to those, it's going to be harder to reach those critical incidents where you can, you know, have things igniting, where you can reach, you know, relatively low ignition energies. Um, I've heard this one a lot is that people get concerned, well, a spark can ignite hydrogen, right? Or a static shock can ignite hydrogen, just, you know, me, me touching something on the carpet or whatever, right? In a realistic leak scenario, like you would get from a piping network or, or a valve that's damaged or something like that, can you ignite the hydrogen with a static spark? Yes, you can. You could also have, you will also have high enough concentrations of propane, of natural gas, or gasoline to ignite those as well. So my point is that, yes, I mean, absolutely you need to be concerned and take the proper, you know, protocols and safeties and things like that. but. It's a very known entity, and when you put it side by side in realistic use cases, things where you're really going to see this, it w I mean, I, I don't think there's any, you know, it, it, it's quite clear based on, like, the physics that it's, that it's equally as safe, if not safer, than most other fuels, especially when you start to compound and look at how all of these things play together, right? So talking about uh, next, the leakage. <laughs> this one's fun. Um, so there's, there's a great, I, I heard this, I was on a panel, and someone was saying, well, hydrogen leaks more than natural gas, so we're real worried about it, right? And, I mean, 
Okay. The, the premise there is that, well, I think what's going through everyone's head is that, well, a hydrogen molecule is very small. That's true, right? And if I have a hole in a pipe, because that molecule is so small, it's just a surface, you know, it's an area game, I can fit more molecules through that hole, right? Which is a really big, all the like molecular physics and chemistry or university folks will get very offended if you tell them that because it's a really oversimplification of what they do every day. The reality is it's not a, so much a surface area, but it's the type of fracture that exists. So there's a seminal study done in 1992 by Swain and Swain where they looked at typical leaks and atypical leaks. So a typical leak is like I damage the threads on a pipe. I you know, crack a seam on a weld or a fitting, something like that, right? Like you generally, most things are, you know, in low pressure piping. And then they looked at atypical things like catastrophic opens, like for whatever reason, I have a big gaping hole. And they looked at propane, natural gas, and hydrogen, and they measured the leakage rates through these. And what they saw was that for typical leaks, the leakage rate was identical for all of them. And they have all of this data shown in their paper. They saw that for atypical leaks, the gaping holes, those things, yes, hydrogen could, under the right conditions, leak faster volumetrically. The volume of gas that could get out would be faster. However, you have to consider the mass, okay? So hydrogen has a lower, a smaller mass than a natural gas or a propane molecule. So if you look at things from a mass perspective, you will still have less hydrogen escaping because of how much smaller that molecule is. You'll have less energy escaping, let's put it that way. What this, ignoring that though, what, what happened is a lot of people have kind of clopped onto that piece of the study and said, well look, hydrogen can, the volumetrically it can leak faster and so therefore it can leak more and that's, that's, we've heard this talking point many times but that's really not what that study was saying at all if you read the whole thing. And it's been demonstrated, on the right I'm showing you some more modern results from 2019 a university, they actually measured leakage in one of the buildings on campus, you know, and they had natural gas running through the building. And that's what you're seeing in the, the X's on that plot is pressure as a function of time. So there's a pressure drop, so there's some leakage in the system, the pressure's coming down, right? Then they emptied it, they filled it with hydrogen, and they measured the leakage again. And they thought they would get more leakage, actually. When they went into this, they probably shouldn't have from a scientific perspective, because they had a, they had, kind of had a, um, you know, they, they thought they knew what they were gonna get, and they didn't. They saw that the leakage was the same, and that's the red, I think it's diamonds or circles, right? They ran this several times, because they didn't believe it at first, right? And they got the same results every time, the leakage was the same. And they actually did a mixture, 10% hydrogen, 90% natural gas, and they saw the same thing, and that's that other, other point on there. And so, the point is that they had identical leakage in the system, identical leakage rates, right? Which just builds on what that earlier study had shown. On a side note, they also showed that there are commercially available epoxies, resins, coatings, things that you can buy. They, they tested a number of them that will completely mitigate those. The pipeline operators, they've been doing this a long time. They, they know how to like, fix pipes and work on pipes and operate pipes, right? And so there are things you can do to mitigate leakage in the, in the, in, in, you know, in the case that you do have it and you have to deal with it, right? Um, last, let's talk about water. We've heard a lot, electrolysis wastes a lot of water, and therefore we shouldn't be doing it, and, and there you go, right? <laughs> um, true, I mean, no, no one's arguing. That is fundamentally electrolysis is the splitting of a water molecule. So, I mean, everyone's, everyone's set there, right? Um, you're breaking the, H2 into the H2O into the H2 and the oxygen. But we also got to consider what are we displacing or what is the comparable thing, right? So what I'm showing you here is water consumption in gallons per kilowatt hour produced. And I'm showing it for like a conventional power generation so we extract natural gas and then we go burn it in like a combined cycle turbine, right? Or we go make hydrogen with an electrolyzer from a renewable or, or any, I mean, in this case, any power source, it's not gonna matter. Um, and then we run it through a fuel cell. And then we also looked at producing hydrogen with an electrolyzer and then um, running it through a, like burning it in a term, burning the hydrogen, right? And what you're seeing is that for these two, the kind of conventional power generation, let's call it, and the electrolyzer of the fuel cells, you have virtually identical, I mean, if I put air bars on this, they'd be within the range of each other, right? Virtually identical water consumption per unit of energy produced, okay? And if you think about it, it does start to make sense. Like, yes, you're using water to produce hydrogen from the electrolyzer, right? But if we know how natural gas is made, 
we're fracking it probably, right? And fracking means I'm pumping a whole boatload of water into the ground to get it back out. Water, which is not too good on this alley. I grew up in like central New York, so the fracking was a common discussion, right? Um, you, it's, it, it's dirty water. It's not, you know, that's dirty water with a lot of chemicals and stuff in it that you're pumping down there. Um, then you have to burn it in your plant and you have to cool the plant. So you have to cool your turbines, right? There's plant cooling. Some plants are closed loops, some are open loops, so there's some you know, variation there. But generally, you're going to arrive about that 0.24 gallons per kilowatt hour produced. And the electrolyzer, absolutely, you're feeding water in, you're going to split it, and then you're going to feed that hydrogen into your fuel cell. The byproduct of that will be effectively chemically pure. I don't know if that's the appropriate term, but it's distilled isn't quite it because it's not distilled. But you're literally recreating the water molecule with the hydrogen and the oxygen, right? So it's about as pure as you can make it. And so that water can then be used to do something else. So even if I'm consuming it here, you do have, you know, usable water on the back end that I can go do something else with, all right? The other thing to note, turbines have been around for a long time. The, the, turbine, the, pot, you know, the engine people, the turbine people, they know how to run these things, and they've been doing it, and they've kind of, you're, you've really kind of pushed the limit of what you can do from an efficiency perspective. I'm not a turbine expert. I'm sure a turbine person will disagree with me and say, no, 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 there's lots of things. But probably we're pushing the limits where it can go, right? There is still room to grow with the electrolyzers and fuel cells. I mean, already an, a fuel cell has a higher efficiency than any, you know, any type of combustion engine. I don't think there's any debate there. And there is, you know, room to grow with each of those and room to improve, which will only help bring that consumption per kilowatt hour down. Okay, this is an excellent article that one of my colleagues, Dr. Thomas Valdez, wrote on this specific topic that if you want to, you know, go read, it's, it's, yeah, it's available. In that, in that paper that, that was referenced in there, there's additional comparisons to look at. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, you know, if we look in, on top of the natural gas production, <clears throat> we were in a meeting uh, here at the Honor Government Affairs team. She and I were at a meeting in New Mexico talking about, it was a roundtable discussion, oh, thanks, so a roundtable discussion about uh, where hydrogen could be um, uh, in, in the economy there in that particular state. And they were telling us about it, it's, it's an oil-producing state close to Texas, and in, in the western part of the state, in the Permian Basin, they were telling us about how much water it takes to extract a, a, a barrel of, of oil. And it was like three to four barrels of water to extract a barrel of oil. So, so if we think about displacing some of these fossil fuels with hydrogen, we're going to be reusing some of that water. So the thought of it's going to take so much more water to do hydrogen on top of what we're doing, there, there's, there's lots of these little myths. And when you start to really start to dig in and you start to understand what's going on. Another thing in, in Thomas's paper, he actually does a comparison. It's not a direct comparison, but it's interesting because you don't really think about these things. He compares, he looks at a, um, a farm, a dairy farm, that has about 5,000 cows. How much water do you think they use in a day? So that farm uses the same amount as we're going to use at 75 tons a day at our facility in New York. One, one farm. So again, it's not a direct energy for energy comparison. But when you start to think about some of the water usages that we have in this country and, and people saying, oh my gosh, electrolyzers are going to use so much water. Where are we going to get all this water from? There's a lot of water that's consumed in a lot of other applications. Some of them we'll be able to replace, some of them we won't. But it's just trying to put things in perspective for people that maybe they can understand. Um, so with that, I don't know, Luke, if you had anything else you want to say. I think we've got uh, some time left, about seven minutes, six or seven minutes for questions. So uh, anybody have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer. <laughs> I'm excited for this. This is a good question. Um, yeah. So well, what, what happens when hydrogen leaks in the atmosphere, right, fundamentally? All right. So, whoa, I'm on. Um, I'm going to hold myself back here. So we first, we got to understand that hydrogen naturally exists in the world. So there's geological, there's natural processes that are producing hydrogen. There's a hydrogen cycle that exists. So there's various things that produce it, and then there's various things that are a sink, and they consume it, okay? So... Some hydrogen is produced from microbial behavior. Some is from, produced from geological processes. Some is produced from um, 
uh, photolysis of different compounds in the atmosphere, okay? So there's, there's a balance of hydrogen in our atmosphere right now that, that exists and that is there, and it's, it's a steady state in the atmosphere. Chemists have been studying this for a long time. So the question is, what, how does hydrogen behave once we get it there? We gotta look at the hydrogen sinks, okay? So some hydrogen, if, if it's in the atmosphere, will slowly move up because it is buoyant, it is diffuse. It's not like it's a rocket taken off, but it will make its way up through our atmosphere to the mid-stratospheric level. And what it can do there is it can participate in a reaction with OH radicals. What that does is it re the, the premise behind this debate is that it removes OH radicals from reacting with methane. And so therefore, it would leave methane in the atmosphere longer. And so that's the premise behind this argument about, well, it's acting as an indirect greenhouse gas. That chemistry is correct, but I mean, that's, it's just, there's a reaction. I mean, there's reactions that occur. If I put these things together, that's what they're gonna do. But you gotta understand the bigger picture here. The first is that all hydrogen out there, about 70, and this is well, I mean, this isn't like, this isn't like me making it, this is just like well-known in the, in the atmospheric and like science, like this world. Um, about 70 to 80% is consumed by microbes in the soil. It's an energy source for them. So there's a variety of microbial species that exist over land, right? And they consume about 70 to 80% of the hydrogen that exists out in the atmosphere in the world today. The other 20 to 25, give or take percent, will go up and participate in those reactions. Now, and then and, and it could, you know, create that scenario. But what you also have to understand is that there's a hydrogen cycle and then there's a what's OH radical. That, that, that is a very complex molecule in and of itself. And so other things affect how many of those exist. And so if I want to say, all right, well, I'm, I'm using the hydrogen. Some of it's going to escape. I'm displacing natural gas or a fossil fuel in some <clears> other <throat> place, right? Because that, that's sensibly what you're doing, right? You're going to be reducing, for example, the amount of NOx that might be generated, right? NOx is also a consumer of OH radicals. So if I reduce the NOx, you're, you're, from one side, I'm increasing the pool. From the other side, you may be decreasing. So, so when people start to say, like, well, it's going to act as a, green, as a greenhouse gas, like, technically, I mean, that, that is a cur or an indirect one. Technically, that is a correct analysis of the assumption. But the question to ask is, to what extent and to what level? And what is the net balance? Because right. could it react? Sure. But what if I'm removing so many, you know, nitrous oxides from the atmosphere that is actually beneficial with respect to that OH radical molecule, right? Um, <clears throat> and what you, what you really need to do is look at, like, that system-wide analysis. And so that has been done several times. Like, Warwick is a really well-known guy that's done it for about 20 years now. And they've shown that if you, I mean, he's... He's shown this in several different, it's been confirmed by other people, but if you transition all natural gas to hydrogen, and so they're, you know, they're, they're looking at big systems here just to make the math, you know, the, the analysis reasonable, and you assume a leakage rate of even 10%, you will have a 94 and a half or 94 and change percent reduction in global warming potential. Yes, some of that that escapes, a portion of that will contribute to some indirect greenhouse warming reaction. But the net benefit is massive, right? right. And 10% and leakage is, is a wild number. That's, a, that's kind of the current leakage rates you see in the, in the natural gas infrastructure, which is like, even, even then, that's, that's a lot. It's so like more realistic, say, half a percent, 2%, something like in there. It's, an, it's a 98 plus percent benefit. And, and that's what happens so many times, and not just that, but a lot, like even this, this IRA study, right, is that if I draw the box the right size, I can get the results to give me anything I want. Right. As, a, as a modeling person or analysis person, if I only look at a small portion of it, if I only say, what are the emissions from battery electric vehicles? It looks great just from if I only look at the car. But if I draw the box bigger and say, all right, well, the power going into the car, right? Or I draw bigger and say the power going into extracting the resources, right? So you really got to start to look at these full, large net scenarios when you try to make these games because you can pick anything apart if I you know, start to break it out. But sorry, I want to. It's a good one. It's fun. <laughs> no, and, and, and the other, you know, you, you touched on it, Luke, but the, the fewer um, fossil fuel solutions that we're, we go after, the fewer molecules of methane there are going to be in the atmosphere to actually do the reaction as well, yeah. too. So there's, there's a lot of things when you look at that net overall, how many things are changing in that net analysis that it has to be looked at. So the, the chemistry isn't wrong. It's the application and all the other things that are happening 
uh, that have to be looked at. Um, you can't just look at one one specific thing. So. Thank you. Anything yep. else? Anything else? Cool. All right. Hey, we're on time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And uh, we'll Thank you. have a good evening.